Hello, I'm Bob Stedler, Land Use and Development Commonist for San Jose Spotlight, the city's first nonprofit news organization dedicated to independent journalism and winner of the 2020 Publisher of the Year Award by the local independent online news publishers. Welcome to our panel presented by San Jose Spotlight and Urban Catalyst, sponsored by the Shane Hour Company and All Good Work. Our panel this afternoon is Surviving COVID-19, What's Next for Downtown San Jose? I'll now introduce our outstanding panelist. Blage Zelalik, Downtown Manager for the City of San Jose. As Downtown Manager, Blage serves as the city's primary lead for downtown issues, opportunities, and relationship management working with city departments and community stakeholders. As a steward of the city's downtown vision and strategy, she coordinates policies and programs that impact downtown employers, retailers, workforce, residents, and visitors. Gary Dillabo with Urban Community. Prolific developer and venture capitalist Gary Dillabo through his company Urban Community has acquired over 20 properties in downtown San Jose. Gary and his partner, Jeff Ariaga have recently partnered with mega developer West Bank as they begin to revitalize key development sites downtown. Their vision will reshape the, down, the downtown traditional core for the next 100 years. And last but not least, Eric Hayden, founder managing part of Urban Catalyst. Eric is the founder of Urban Catalyst, Silicon Valley's leading multi-asset opportunity zone fund. Eric is responsible for developing more than 3.5 billion in real estate projects in the Bay Area, including over 2,300 residential units. His leadership has Urban Catalyst deploying over 800 million into seven projects in downtown San Jose, ranging from student housing to hotels, multifamily apartments, senior assisted living, memory care, and commercial office buildings. And got that out of the way. So again, thank you all panelists for being here. Um, so just let's just get to the crux of it. And let's, you know, while the world is the world, uh, what development opportunities are you excited about being implemented in downtown San Jose? Eric, maybe start with you. Sure. I mean, obviously, one of the biggest things that everybody's watching right now is BART coming to downtown San Jose. I and mean, that's going to be a real game changer for the downtown. And you really can't miss uh, Google's, you know, giant campus that they're planning. That's obviously really exciting. But Really, you know, what's more exciting to me is when I see the small businesses starting on the streets. I know during COVID, it's not as uh, it's not as obvious, but when you see the restaurants open up, when you see people gathering to uh, join these new establishments, that's really the exciting thing that's going on in downtown. That blogging. Yeah, I think I want to piggyback on what Eric said. Um, you know, there are some things that that come to mind uh, or that we've been in the news about lately, kind of the big the big developments, Google and Jay Paul, and um, I'm not gonna steal any of uh, Gary's thunder, obviously, uh, but I am actually really excited about one of the kind of seemingly smaller things, um, which I think is gonna be a really big deal for uh, a location that, that has needed some TLC for a while. And that is really the corner of First in Santa Clara and what's happening at the corner of First in Santa Clara and going from basically kind of a, a no activity corner to having all four of those buildings um, in, in various stages of renovation and, and ready to come online with what, what Gary and West Bank are doing at the mm -hmm. beautiful Bank of Italy building, uh, Divco at 2 West Santa Clara in the former Walgreens um, uh, building uh, with Jay Paul at 1 West Santa Clara and then uh, the folks at um, the, the building uh, Marwood's building at the northeast corner. And so having, you know, those four buildings come online that presumably bring, you know, when, when we can all come back to our offices, um, 1,500 to 2,000 employees into that, that <clears throat> corner right at the hub, main and main, it, it is really, really exciting to me. Gary, you're in the mix of it all and you're creating probably half of it. So I'd be curious to see your, your thoughts. Yeah, listen, I, I think that uh, when you talk about things that are exciting to me, there's short term and then long term. And, uh, you know, Bank of Italy to me is, is a short term project. And I, I think it really is a kind of a, a bit iconic in that. To me, it represents a, a lot of a, what San Jose is all about. It's got some beautiful infrastructure and had an amazing history and um, it has tremendous potential. And, uh, you know, th this is something that you know, we're, we're starting back up on construction here in the next few weeks. <clears throat> so we're hoping that's something as to Blogge's point, 
uh, will come online in the near future and, and really activate that first in Santa Clara area, which, you know, when, when you think about downtown, there's a few areas like San Pedro Market right now that have a certain level of vitality. And hopefully that will start to, you know, kind of spill over to the, uh, the areas east of Santa Clara. Uh, but I also think about long term and, uh, you know, kind of where we're all heading. And I think it's hard to really understand some of Eric's projects or our projects because they're just drawings. And uh, yeah, until you see cranes, until you see these things coming, you know, started to take form and it's hard to, to understand what kind of a impact they'll have. And I think the graduate was, was a great example of something that went up quickly. It's, it's a nice project and really kind of revitalizing that area. And I think it's, you know, you know what we're excited about is, is having our five or six projects starting to get out of the ground. Uh, we did break ground a few weeks ago on uh, the old museum place, which we call now Park Habitat. Mm -hmm. And I think in about a month, we're gonna have the ability to, you know, really walk people through all of our projects. We, we, we haven't been too engaged with, with the conversation with the press so far uh, because we really wanted to get these things designed into the city and kind of demonstrate we're moving in the right direction. Um, so I, I think, again, sometime in January, but the latest, we can really start to walk people through in detail where we're heading and how all this stuff integrates with Eric's projects, with James Paul projects. And people can start to see not a bunch of individual buildings, but hopefully a city starting to come together. Yeah, we're exciting to see that. Uh, Blogge, with nearly half of downtown businesses shuttered, what is the city of San Jose doing to attract new businesses to the downtown core? So right, right now, and basically over the last nine months, the city's focus has really been on supporting and in investing um, in our existing businesses. Um, obviously, thankfully, we actually we do have folks that are coming to us and saying um, they're interested in spaces and and we've had um, some, some openings over the last six months. Um, Nirvana Soul in the Sofa area, um, the uh, Holy Cannoli along Santa Clara Street, Plant Lush um, in kind of our, our most recent opening. Patiscos uh, in the Sofa area from the, from the folks uh, that brought us a data are, are just to name a few. But basically what we've been doing is supporting, uh, focusing on supporting our existing businesses. Right, the, the idea, the recovery stage that we're in, um, our problem isn't you know, inefficient businesses, but it's, it's rather kind of the impossible business conditions that they're having to deal with right now because of the pandemic. Um, and it just, you know, the ever-changing nature makes it so difficult um, uh, for them to sustain themselves. And so we've been trying to push out information and access to funding and other resources um, posting and, and delivering messaging from sjeconomy.com, which is the SJ uh, uh, Economy website, our monthly newsletter, weekly news flashes, um, the COVID-19 business assistance uh, email and, and business hotline as well. So, you know, we're just, we're trying to be supportive. There have been some financial resources um, from the uh, state and federal level that we've been trying to push out. We've had some small resources uh, on, on the city's level. Actually, you know, right now we have a grant out uh, for qualifying businesses in the greater downtown area. It's a small grant, but you know, in listening to, to business owners um, downtown and in the surrounding area, every little bit helps. And so, you know, as of right now, uh, we have about 1% of our businesses downtown um, that we think have probably permanently closed, but the, the vast majority of the businesses that are seemingly shuttered um, are, are shuttered because they really can't operate under the current business conditions that really, it, it's really not feasible. So we're just going to continue to be supportive in all of the ways that we were able to and also advocate for additional resources, including financial resources um, for our businesses. <laughs> Uh, to, to the best of our ability. Yeah, I think that's that's where we're kind of focused on right now. And so I think the next question too, with you know, COVID-19 driving people out of downtown for the time being, how can we increase the daytime post population? And just looking at chat, you know, Walter Wilson, Minority Business Consortium mentioning about how do we plan, you know, future growth and future tenants and by maybe creating grants and opportunities to assist in the process. And I, I think it's a great idea because we're going to want to have as many diverse retail and just businesses downtown. Um, 
So what do you, you know, with, with redevelopment gone and, you know, the limited resources we have, um, what do you think are the kind of drivers we can use to kind of plan some of this post COVID um, boom that we can see? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, the same, some of the same drivers um, that were here pre COVID are, are anticipated to be here post COVID, right? Some of the things that, um, the, the big things that attracted Gary and Jeff and kind of and West Bank and their their consortium of investors and Eric and and his group um, around the the transit infrastructure that's going to be built around you know the opportunity uh, downtown the ability um, to to densify the flexibility and kind of zoning and and policy um, the you know the the come let's grow versus the anti-growth mentality that we have as a city. I mean, none of those things are, are going away. Um, and I think, you know, I've, I've heard uh, both Gary and, and Eric say this, that in terms of the, the longer term prospects, you know, we continue, um, we continue to be and then the investment con uh, community continues to be bullish on downtown. It is difficult to see the forest from the trees um, right now, because you know we have had many longtime business owners that invested their blood, sweat, and tears into downtown, and, and a lot of those folks are struggling, right? And, and those are the, the folks that really just your hearts go out to. Um, but but ultimately, I think the, the good news is that the things that originally made you know downtown a great place to invest and and, and put down your de development roots, so to speak. Um, two years or three years ago are still fundamentally there. I mean, Gary, do you, what are your thoughts on, you know, I mean, part of the vision of what you're doing is, you know, it's not for tomorrow, it's for, you know, three, five, 20 years out. Yeah. Um, from a practical perspective, you know, when, when, when we brought our team into this equation, uh, we recognize, we, we believe there was going to be some kind of economic downturn, significant one, in between the time that we purchased these properties and by the time these properties would be built. Uh, we just didn't recognize it would happen as quickly and as dramatically as it has. And they, uh, yeah, I, I'm still confused by the where the stock market's at <clears throat> and where Main Street's at. It just feels like there's a total disconnect. So, um, you know, to Blage's point, I, I think what's happening on the street right now is really... Uh, unfortunate and uh, it's challenging. <clears throat> um, I think if, if we look past a vaccine that um, you know, we, we've heard groups like Live Nation talk about you know, this revenge spend that, that people are gonna get re-engaged in communities and areas like this. And you know, they, I, I think if there's any silver lining, which I, it's hard to say a silver lining through this, this whole COVID thing, I think it's taught us how much we value uh, being with other people and being outdoors with our friends and spending time with one another. And, and although we're very efficient right now with all these Zoom calls, it just isn't what life's about to me. So a, um, you know, our, our hope is that we can start to put in the, the building blocks to have a landing zone that when people come back, it's really inspiring and it's really vibrant. And you know, companies like Adobe will tell you that there are people are really waiting. They're excited to come back to work, but they they want to come back to some to a place that that's really authentic, that's engaging, that's that's comfortable. And a uh, you know places like Austin and Boulder, Colorado, and Sydney, Australia, you know they they figure this out, and we we've got to do a better job of creating that kind of environment for them. I think it's eminently doable, or, or you know it's very possible because the city has so much infrastructure. But I think we have to have an attitude perspective that makes us confident and feel good about what the city can become because it has so many great assets. Then secondarily, we just got to start to do the tactical things to make it a safer environment, to make it a little cleaner environment. And then a, um, you know, the, the, those, are, those are blocking and tackling issues I think that we're well equipped to take care of. But we got to stop talking about some of these things and start to do them. So, Bob, you know, when I look at downtown and, you know, to just kind of talk about what Blog and Gary were just talking about, there are three things that we look for when we do development anywhere. And downtown San Jose has all three of them. We've been developers all over the Bay Area for our career. The first is we wanna see demand for all the different types of projects. And that demand hasn't gone away because that's the Silicon Valley job engine. And Silicon Valley companies have been doing better than most other companies during the pandemic. And that's not going anywhere. The second is we wanna see transit and physical infrastructure already in place. 
you know, the San Jose local government over the last 50 years has put so much infrastructure improvement into downtown. It just has amazing bones. We've got Deeradon Station. We have San Jose State right in the heart of downtown. We have BART coming to downtown. You know, we have Caltrain. We, we have the VTA lines. I mean, really, downtown San Jose is the only true urban environment in Silicon Valley. Uh, the last thing we want to see is something that Blaga touched on is we want to see places where they want to see development happen in the right way, of course. But a lot of cities here in the Bay Area don't want to see development at all. And having downtown San Jose say, we want to see developers come, we want to build out, we want to do it in the right way, we want to encourage you to be here. That's a big deal to us because getting through the pre-construction process to start construction on your, on your projects is a, is a challenging aspect to building new projects. It, in California, it's the most challenging aspect. So having downtown be proactive in working with developers is very important. And, and, and Bob, I just say one other thing is that, you know, uh, what, what gives me confidence and hope is that when you look at a, 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 an entity like Nirvana Soul, you know, they opened up a coffee shop in the middle of this pandemic. Um, and you look at how successful they've been and they have a good product and then people want to be, you know, that, that's the kind of environment they want to go to. They did, they did a nice job in what they did with their facility. Uh, the Adega guys, what they've done there in SOPA as well. It's a great product. It's a great group of people who understand the city really well. So when you see those bright spots during this dark time, I think it gives us hope that we can create a lot more of that. It's just, you know, now it's our, it's our turn to really kind of, you know, make sure that more groups like that are, are given the opportunity to succeed. Yeah, I, I think when we, we took a lot of slings and arrows at redevelopment on San Pedro Square Urban Market, and we just held our ground knowing that long term that was going to be a smart play to invest in. And, you know, a million dollars on extra sidewalk. As you see now, I mean, with that extra space in front of the coffee in that whole area, it was just a good investment in what downtown could be. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, you know, we, we, a lot of late night meetings trying to respond to council members trying to kill the project. And I think it's just, it's about the resolve. And I just think, you know, something we just need to kind of remind ourselves of. Yep. So, so Gary and Eric, um, what is the status of some of your biggest investments in downtown and how has COVID kind of changed or modified your plans as you're uh, about to break ground on several, several of them? Eric, you want to go? Sure. Uh, so we have seven projects here in downtown San Jose and a variety of different types of projects. And overall, COVID hasn't impacted the timing of any of them. In fact, um, you know, we're in the pre-construction process. We're planning on breaking ground on our first projects in April, May of next year and breaking ground on all of them in 2021 and maybe a little bit into early 2022. Uh, working with the city has been fantastic. I mean, when we started shelter in place back in March, I remember three days in, uh, Rosalind, the head of planning, reached out to us and said, hey, we're working from home, but we want to make sure that you know that we're here and we want to be working with you to process these projects and make sure you don't have delays. And they have done just that. And it's been a, a fantastic experience working with them uh, throughout the pandemic, even though they're working from home, they're still very efficient. Um, you know, really besides that, we of course are incorporating slightly different design techniques into our projects. You know, things like touchless entry, touchless elevators, you know, certain UV inside of our elevators that kills bacteria, additional HVAC systems that give you cleaner air. Uh, new office layouts for our office projects. You know, the small things that really add up to make a difference when you deliver a project to the market post COVID. Uh, when we're talking about, you know, changes to plans, obviously financing is more of an issue than it was before COVID started for construction loans to build buildings. Overall, however, I would say that in general, there is construction of uh, financing available for almost every type of project out there. Probably the most challenging one is spec ground up office. But I mean, hotels, senior living, student housing, multifamily, all of that is um, is definitely still available. Hi, right, Gary. Yeah, listen, I, I would echo a lot of what uh, Eric said. Uh, we are extraordinarily lucky to have a um, uh, a city hall that is pro development and, and I think, think thoughtful and the, the, the stance it takes. It's not reckless, but it, it, it's, it's a, a smart. Uh, they have been nothing but um, 
extremely helpful. And, uh, you know, they, they challenge us when they should. And, uh, but they also make sure that, that things are moving pretty quickly. And, and they, they see this window of time as a really unique opportunity for San Jose. So uh, to me, that, that gives me, again, uh, a lot of hope that if we're doing this in the middle of San Francisco, uh, I think we'd just be stuck in the water right now, right? So um, we're, we're fortunate to have that. Um, and I also think that, you know, um, it's interesting when I look at a lot of development companies, not all, but a lot of development companies, I call them, they're not really real estate owners, they're, they're transactors. You know, how do I get a transaction done as opposed to how do I really become part of the community? And um, I think that's what we're trying to do in, in our approach here. It's not just to get buildings up and then to get them <clears throat> leased and sold. You know, the, the goal is how do we work with the community to figure out what's the right amount of housing? What's the right amount of office? How do we work with Eric and you know people like Jay Paul and John Sobrato to make sure that we we're we're starting to you know kind of learn and work with one another to create something special for the area. So I think we're lucky. You know we don't have a lot of developers coming in from New York or from you know places around the world, and they're just going to get in and out. You know the people here working right now really seem to have a vested interest, certainly in this region. So those are things that they give me a, a lot of a um, hope for the future. And listen. The biggest asset we have outside of all the assets that, that, that Eric talked about earlier, the city has, we've got Google, Facebook, Netflix, ServiceNow, Intel, the list goes on and on. We've got the greatest companies in the world that, that surround the city that are going to look for new kinds of solutions to their office and living situations and transportation situations. And we have kind of a blank canvas to build that for them. So, you know, if we do things correctly, this could be one of those cities that kind of demonstrates to the rest of the country of how you adapt, how you evolve, and how you create a special place where tech companies uh, and all the support systems that surround them, uh, how it comes out of the ground. Yeah, I think it's that is the driver. Um, so, I, you know, as we see San Jose State starting to kind of come out of their shell and come out of the campus, you see they're managing the Hamburg Theater. Um, they're about to get the Alquist property. They're working on student housing projects with developers, you know, off campus. How do you see the urban design relationship between San Jose State and downtown becoming more integrated? Eric, I'd love to see if you start there since. Sure. So you know, the, the first thing I look at, obviously, is, you know, we're building a student housing high rise right next to San Jose State. And creating new student housing to meet the demand for San Jose State is really important. The, the demand right now is really extreme. I mean, obviously with COVID and online classes only, it's like we get a year break from the demand. But when classes go back to in-person in a year or two, we're gonna see that demand jump right back into our face again. So creating new student housing, extremely important. Um, Obviously, having the light rail right near downtown is important to integrating San Jose State into downtown. The Paseo de San Antonio and San Jose State's ownership of the Alquist building, Hammer Theater. You know, one of our projects is we're renovating the Camera 12 Cinema site. And how do we incorporate that into uh, understanding the San Jose State students that will be utilizing that? that Paseo and that alley, utilizing those buildings, those uh, amenities in the downtown, how can we integrate into that to really make San Jose State and downtown into uh, an easy transition, into uh, a way to create a synergy between the, the two entities? Gary, I'd love to get your thoughts as well. Yeah, geez, I, I just wish I was as articulate as Eric. I, I would say exactly that, but I, I'd use one other word and I'd use leadership. Um, I think that Mary and Charlie, the, the, the city couldn't be luckier to have those folks running that, 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 that school right now. Um, they, they have great vision, they care, they roll up their sleeves and they, um, they're, they're gonna make the change that we're all talking about. But you know, again, leadership is really important and the mindset they have is, um, it, to me, it's always inspiring. And so that's uh, one of these great assets, the city just, you know, we, <laughs> we've got these great companies all around us and we've got this amazing university. It's kind of this hidden gem that's kind of finally starting to, I think people are starting to recognize more publicly how important it is and, um, you know, the, the great direction they're, they're moving into. Well, Aki, I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, as, as someone who's been with the Downtown Association for a long time and I think you've kind of seen their mindset evolve. Hey, blogging, you're on mute. Somehow I was muted. Sorry. Uh, in terms of the mindset, meaning the San Jose State's mindset? Yes, yeah, the... I just, you know, from, yeah. from maybe it, it has changed, right? I mean, they did several leadership changes in the last 20 they, years. 
they they have had several leadership changes, and I think um, I think to reiterate Gary's point, the leadership that there is now um, uh, with Mary Papazian and Charlie Foss and the whole the whole kind of executive team, our relationship with San Jose State goes you know way beyond just the physical buildings and kind of the development that they're doing, um, and it, it really gets to this level of integration in the community. I mean, they are, uh, again, you know, nationally acclaimed, nationally accredited, but have, I don't think any university in the nation has flown so under the radar, quite honestly, um, um, than San Jose State in terms of, of kind of the, the output and the talent that is generated in San Jose State and goes on um, to, to work uh, in our Silicon Valley community. So, I think you know they interject a, a lot of spirit um, and energy into the downtown. I think that we we haven't always in the past been um, as successful as we'd like to be in really integrating students. But with these student housing projects, with with the university coming a little bit more off campus, mm -hmm. um, and then you know kind of the the city and the downtown um, integrating um, onto the campus a little bit more. Um, I, I think that, that that synergy is really there. This past year, uh, it was unfortunate. They had like a ton of um, downtown activities um, planned for their new incoming students. And, and many of those, actually most of those fell by the wayside as, as really only 50% of students are, are quote unquote in town and they're doing you know 95% of their, their studies virtually right now. And they don't expect to be back until uh, the springtime. But they still um, did this, you know, great campaign of like SJSU hearts DTSJ, um, and there are a ton of really great videos um, that they they have put together, um, and a lot of, of kind of baskets and and encouragement for students to to get out and, and visit a lot of the the downtown establishments. So I, I think bottom line is um, uh, the relationship. I think is stronger and more fruitful than ever. And I think we, we all only see that going in, in a more positive direction. Yeah, so the next question is, you know, what is the hidden, hidden gem of downtown? For me, it's San Jose State um, as a Spartan. Um, I'd love to, you know, go around blogging, come back to you. Um, what, what do you, what's your hidden gem of downtown? There are a lot of gems and, Thankfully, they get less and less hidden, um, kind of as, as people discover them. Um, I, I certainly have a soft spot for the moment shops at San Pedro. It was a project that I worked on at the Downtown Association and walked on, worked on um, in my transition to uh, the city. And, and really, if you talk about uh, the change that just activating that side of the street on San Pedro, taking it from you know just the the bottom of a very functional and very very um, needed and desired parking garage, but turning it into you know a space that's that's really about public life and promotes entrepreneurship. Um, it really, it's it's fantastic, and I think that that um, it still is is very hidden kind of because downtown San Jose is not strong on retail. It's not known for retail. It's um, more known for kind of food and, and uh, its restaurants. But those shops at moment at the bottom of San Pedro Square have really served, um, have served us well in, in kind of the fabric of building a city. They, they really, I would say the, the project was way more expensive than originally anticipated. Um, and, but the return on investment, um, not necessarily financially, but what it does for us in, in kind of the evolution of a city it is really priceless. Uh, Bob, you better let me go next because there's no sure. way I can follow uh, Gary answering this question. <laughs> I know Gary knows every gem in the city. Uh, mine is really easy. I, I love Levick and the orange sauce at Levick. I have lunch there quite Ooh. often and it is just fantastic. Yeah. Um, you know, listen, I, I, I think that they, um, my answer is um, the people on this call, the, the people that we get to deal with every single day in downtown, it's really the people. It has nothing to do with the physical assets. The weather's great. 
but a, um, you know, I, I've never been involved with a group of people so uh, passionate and so fascinating and, and so convicted to make a city, you know, become kind of take it to the next level. And uh, like when you look at a great tech company, it's all about the people. And I, I think the same thing is going to be true for the city. It's all about the people. And they, um, I just don't, I don't get a similar feel when I go to a place like Oakland or San Francisco, um, maybe a place like Austin. But I, uh, I think San Jose is, is really special because of the, the, the people who've been here for such a long time that have gone to San Jose State that, you know, see the potential of the city and, and are willing to start to fight for it. Um, so that's my vote. All, all great answers. Um, so the, the big question that, you know, I get more often than not, you know, three, four times a day is what impact do you see Google having on downtown San Jose in the long term? And, you know, it's, the construction is going to be 10 to 30 years. Um, but I do think it, it is a sea change of mentality. So I'd love to maybe, you know, Gary, go back to you and just kind of, since you've got experience in the tech world, just love to hear your thought process. Yeah, listen, um, you know, <laughs> would you not want to have Google coming here? And, you know, I, I think it's a pretty clear answer, right? Uh, it's funny, I, I live by Menlo Park and, um, you know, I always think that that, Santa, that Stanford's always trying to do amazing things for the city. And for some reason, the city seems to fight them on every front. And when they do something, it's spectacular. And, and they really do have kind of a community mindset and they're, they're playing long ball. They're, they're looking at, you know, decades, if not hundreds of years of how their, their uh, institution evolves. And I, I think that's kind of what, you know, San Jose needs to make sure that we really understand that, that, that kind of mentality so th th those are the kind of things that, you know, um, I, I think are important. And um, I, I just hope that we, we, we all kind of embrace what, what Google's trying to do, because they're going to invest billions and billions of dollars. And a, um, I don't think they're trying to build a fortress. Uh, and I think they're trying to look at housing in a really thoughtful way. And that they're trying to, you know, kind of, you know, um, look, look at a new model. Um, I, I think we couldn't be more fortunate. Listen, I, I would say the same of, of Jay Paul. I mean, I, I think Jay Paul is you know, something that, that sometimes is overlooked and just kind of taken for granted. Uh, the bet he made and what they're doing is really impressive. And together, uh, the, those two groups uh, can you know, help, help put us on, in, in a much different place than we sit today. I would just like to interject that um, the investment that Jay Paul has made is definitely not taken for granted. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, to, just to get on the record with, with that, I mean, all, all of the, you know, Bob, you had mentioned, you know, with, with the demise of, of redevelopment or the sunset of redevelopment, kind of what were the prospects. I mean, mm -hmm. what we really saw was this like tremendous, it's not even silver lining, it's like gold lining, which is the private sector and folks um, like Gary and Jay Paul and Google and Urban Catalyst basically Stepping, and, and many others, right? We have a lot of we have a lot of other smaller local developers that have been here for a really long time, but have really that stepped into that place and and stepped into the place where they um, they brought their heart and their soul and their sweat equity and and are investing it in downtown and in in essence are our redevelopment 2.0, but even better because it's it's coming it's market driven and it's coming from the private sector and it's coming from um, a, a group of folks that really care about community, um, you know, as, as did the folks um, in redevelopment, but, but it's coming from a really good place. Yeah, I mean, Eric, we, we talked on a podcast, you know, like what Blogger was saying about, you know, with redevelopment gone, now it's a, you know, it's the private sector kind of driving this, taking, you know, the cue from what you saw in the past. And I think, you know, for me, I'm really happy to see Camera 12, you know, become revitalized, People have asked about, you know, Park Center Plaza, you know, this is it's 1970. It was a nice project then, but I'm excited to see, you know, the next phase. And, and you're really kind of at the forefront with Gary on the, you know, 2.0 aspect of downtown. Uh, I appreciate you saying that. I mean, the revitalization of downtown has been my passion for decades. So I, I'm, I'm happy to be a part of, of what is happening in the downtown area and creating projects that the community wants and needs. I did want to talk a little bit about Google and their effects on downtown because I think it's a really important topic. It's what we talk about a lot. Uh, the investors that invest in our fund, it's a question they have every single day. Uh, overall, I'm really pleased with, with what Google is doing. 
I think it's interesting that people say, what will be the Google effect? When I see just the, the fundamental real estate and the market here in downtown San Jose, that is the cause and Google is the effect. They're here because of what downtown San Jose is becoming. And I really like the way that the city has worked with them, not only working with them to have them come to downtown, but also not doing it the same way that like Amazon went out and did their HQ2 where they said, what are you gonna give us? What are you gonna give us? What are you gonna give us? This was Google came and said, we wanna be downtown. The city said, we want you to be downtown, but what are you gonna give us? And the answer was more below market rate housing because when you build office on a scale that is that big, uh, you're going to have that gentrification and displacement and you need to offset it with some type of, of housing. So city is making them build, you know, 5,000, 6,000 residential units, 25% below market rate instead of 15% below market rate. And Google is doing their own thing where they're going out and just building below market rate housing, dedicating money to below market rate housing. I think that's really important. Also the downtown, you know, everyone talks about downtown. We've had these conversations for years, which is how come there's not better retail downtown? You know, how do we get people downtown? Do we build residential? Is that how we bring people downtown? And it's a number of different answers, but the answer really is we need more people. If at, in the evening in the downtown core, there's 75,000 people. And in the day it expands, this is not during COVID, expands to about 100,000 people. What if Google comes down here their primary office and residential is going to be about 30,000 people. And there have been some estimates that some of their supporting folks that come in there, you know, other types of services that surround them, that's going to bring up to 75,000 people a day to downtown. It, does that double the size of downtown? Does that get us that, that uh, you know, critical mass so that we can have the retail on the streets that people think define cities? And I think it absolutely does. So I'm very pleased with what Google is up to. Yeah, it's exciting to see, and, and there's a planning commission study session going on as we speak on um, on that area as well, the Dearden Station area plan. Um, so, you know, another thing that we've been seeing, you know, I think George Avalos had a, a story and, and Spotlight has also been covering the real estate market. You know, we had like, you know, $3 billion in a matter of weeks invested into the Bay Area you know, Gary and Eric, why do you think international capital markets are flocking to San Jose to place their money? Gary, I'd love to maybe start with you and then we can, Derek. Yeah, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, and people are, you know, well, first of all, I don't think it's that hard of an equation to figure out. Um, I, I think if you look at where you have you know, these, these great companies and where they can grow, they just don't have a place to grow. And I think a lot of people and in some of the comments from the, uh, from the discussion here is asking about, you know, places like, you know, uh, or, you know, um, Austin or, you know, Colorado, there, there's certainly companies that are moving that direction because you know, California is not making it easy for companies to be here, but Facebook's not leaving. Netflix is not leaving. Uh, Google's not leaving. Apple's not leaving. You know, the list goes on and on of companies that aren't going to leave and they need places to expand. Um, now I, I think that the, this tech sector is only growing. Uh, I, I, you know, I hope people understand how, how important these companies are to the world and not just to this region. And we've got to, you know, I always say that we had to start to help solve the problems that they're, they're grappling with. And that's housing, that's transportation. We've got to be as good for them as they are for us. And we haven't been. Real estate has not served these companies very well. And they get stuck in, you know, business parks out in the middle of Santa Clara and Sunnyvale and have million square foot campuses and have to brought, have bring all these infrastructure in to serve their, their, their teams. We have to solve that and leverage what's being done here. So, you know, to me, that, that's where I, I ultimately think that, you know, we have to solve these problems. They're, they're, they're not, you know, this is not a uh, calculus here. This is pretty straightforward, good urban planning and places like, you know, Redwood City has done a great job of it. It's our turn now to kind of say, we can take this to scale. We can make this happen for these companies. And if we do that correctly, um, it really is going to be a model, I think, for, for the states to figure out you know, how, their, how their cities can do this. Eric? So, uh, you know, it's interesting, you know, the, the purchase of so many office buildings in Silicon Valley, even in here in downtown San Jose. You know, we first saw this in July 
when two high rises sold in downtown, one was an office high rise, uh, one was a class A apartment building. Class A set new record prices on a price per square foot. The office came pretty close. And after that, just a flood of office sales. And here we are thinking, I mean, I know everybody on the, on the tip of their tongues is saying, well, isn't everybody gonna work from home forever? Isn't, is, is office gonna have demand here in Silicon Valley? And if you're a, a, an institutional equity group or an institutional real estate group, and you're looking to place money in the United States, and you're thinking, where am I going to place money this year? The answer to them is Silicon Valley, because this is where we have these strong tech companies that have been thriving throughout the pandemic. They do have demand for office, and this is, this is that flight to safety. We've also seen in a lot of major national media, you know, Forbes magazine, Bloomberg, a, a list of cities, you know, top 10 cities to recover from the pandemic. And San Jose is in the top 10 of every single one of those lists. Bloomberg had us at number one. So when we see that happening, that is that flight to safety, that source of these big international national uh, equity groups coming into downtown in Silicon Valley. And it's great to see. Well, hey, but Eric, the only thing that I, I would, I would, I would maybe kind of, you know, push back on that a little bit is sometimes that money is just, you know, again, I, like I said earlier, I think it's an easy equation to see, but this is kind of herd mentality, and that herd mentality starts to rush in, and then they start to create pricing levels that are unrealistic, um, and we have to be careful about that. And again, these guys, this 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 money coming in from from offshore doesn't give a shit about San Jose. You know, they just care about a spreadsheet and economic return. So that's why I'm hoping that uh, you know, the local development community continues to step forward and do what Eric's doing and, and really kind of transforming the city. Because if, if it's done from local groups, it's going to be far better than these pension funds or money coming from out, outside the area. Yeah, I think let's kind of jump on that. I'd love to talk about what differentiates San Jose from the rest of the country in terms of the recovery. Um, you know, blog, I know, think we're kind of focused on just kind of uh, taking care of the people we have downtown today. But, you know, when we've been doing economic development and, you know, pushing it out nationwide, you know, especially with conventions and everything, you know, what do you, what's the feedback that you've heard about what differentiates San Jose from the rest of the country? Yeah, I think that we've, we've got um, kind of a unique position in the sense that um, we've got a high percentage of our folks that are uh, professionals that are in sectors that can work from home. And so folks are, are continuing to, to work, right? And companies are continuing um, to, to move forward their products and their plans and, and um, yes, with some adjustments um, and uh, yes, with some with some slight deviations, but but we're generally continuing to be very, very productive, right? And I think also at the same same time, we have a pretty strong kind of manufacturing R&D sector in, in our, um, in our uh, city, uh, not necessarily downtown, but in, in our city uh, that is considered essential and continues to work, right, on, on site in, in many cases. And so I think having kind of that that balance across the economy of our city um, is, is really helping us or, or will help us in terms of the rate of economic recovery. That's not to say that it's that it's not still devastating, right? I mean, I, all of this stuff has caveats. And if you look at the numbers for our, um, from our metro area, kind of the, the spending and, and leisure and hospitality, kind of the, lob, the jobs lost or the unemployment in, in the, leisure and hospitality sectors. I mean, we're hit hard by that and, and downtown is hit especially hard because much of downtown's um, um, economy is based on the convention center and the SAP center and our theaters and our culture, um, our, our cultural experiences um, and our hotels and business travel, right? So, so not, not taking the effect of that away uh, in any way, shape or form, but, but the bottom line is that we are, we are pretty balanced um, and, and pretty kind of high, high functioning and high performing. And so that um, presumably gives us the, the, the edge um, on, on recovery than maybe some other, other of, our, of our peers. Gary, I'd love to kind of get your feedback when you go around the country and you're talking about, you know, San Jose. I'd love to kind of get your perspective on, you know, 
you talked about those other places that we need to kind of strive towards, but what feedback have you kind of heard when you talk to people about San Jose? <laughs> yeah, so I was just at the dentist and a, um, um, to get my teeth cleaned and uh, the person cleaning my teeth, I just, she goes, what are you up to? And I was talking, you know, kind of half muted about San Jose and she goes, oh, San Jose, what are you talking about? San Jose is just, I would never go there. I, I went there one time for a bar and it just, it was terrible. And a, um, I, I just think that a lot of people have the wrong impression of San Jose. They've been here once or twice and that they, they really haven't understood kind of what's below the covers. Um, I do think that we have some safety issues that need to be addressed. I think if you go to places like Willow Glen or if you go to the Rose Garden, I, I think that you feel safer and more comfortable there. I think that downtown needs a greater presence. And I, I think that we need, you know, people to really engage and feel pride and, you know, uh, yeah, help uh, address this homeless issue. You know, I think people have said, hey, San Francisco is kind of, they've lost control. We're on the brink and we've, we've got to take control of this right now. So people see it happening. And, you know, I, I think the biggest thing for me is I, I brought so many capital sources down here. I, I can't tell you. And they will have one experience with a naked person running around yelling and screaming at them. And that's not what downtown's about, but that's what they see. And that's what they remember. And so we have to recognize that sometimes people can kind of blow these things off. Ah, it's just kind of an isolated incident. It's not. We have to fix this problem because people still don't see San, San Jose in the way that people who are here every single day do. Um, so I, I think it has some reputational issues. I, I think to Eric's earlier point, when you look at studies and you know, kind of national information, people are gravitating here because they see it from a, micro, a macro perspective. But you know, from a micro perspective, we got to make sure that we take, ser take care of some of these details. I drive in down 280 every day to the office and I get off on 87 and the amount of trash and filth on that overpass in that intersection, that's our front door. And if we're, if we're okay with that being our front door, I, I don't think the synthesis is ever gonna achieve the greatness it can achieve. If you walked into a person's house and there's crap all over their front yard and stuff by the front door, you wouldn't wanna go in. And so we have to stop accepting that and putting our foot down and talking to Caltrans and talking to the county and then making sure that we take care of those things if we want to change people's perception of San Jose, because it's not what it should be. Hey, Eric? I mean, I don't know how to follow what Gary just said. I mean, he really encapsulated uh, a lot of it. I mean, what I see, and like Gary, I brought, you know, hundreds of investors to downtown San Jose. You know, we have over 250 investors in our fund. Uh, I do tours of downtown at least two or three times a week. And we walk around and in general, people say, boy, I haven't been downtown in 20 years. Sure has changed a lot. Boy, look at all these construction sites. We sure can see the potential, but not quite there yet, is it? Man, this reminds me of Denver 10 years ago. I mean, San Jose is an interesting town, right? We're the 10th largest city in America, but geographically, we're so big that the downtown is actually really quite small. And people don't understand why downtown is the way it was, why it got so bad 40 years ago, uh, why it rose to prominence in the 20s and 30s in the first place. And if you understand all the history, San Jose is moving in the right direction, but we still obviously, as Kerry mentioned, have a lot of things that we need to resolve before we can really move forward in a meaningful way. Yeah, I would totally agree. And Gary, to, to your point on Caltrans, you know, I've been advocating for a long time that we should get our own Caltrans district down here. Um, unfortunately, right now we're wrapped up in San Francisco and Oakland. And, and you know, that's one large Caltrans district. And it's just, I think it's too big. I've been advocating for a while that we should kind of get our own Caltrans district, you know, probably from San Mateo County down to here and just kind of get our resources better focused. So. Hey, crap. I, I, I want to jump in a truck and drive down that median once a month to clean, you know, pick up that trash. I mean, it's like um, I, I've got a little history with 280. My, my dad worked for the Federal Highway Administration and uh, he was actually played a big part in the allocation of money from the federal government to the state mm -hmm. government to build 280. So I've got more pictures in my you know, family album of you know, dirt and Jersey barriers and asphalt than, than I ever want to admit. But he always had this, you know, such pride in 280. And 280 is losing it. And I, I, I just can't believe it. Every day I drive down at how disgusting.
interesting it is, especially when we get to the downtown San Jose. But this is where we, as a group of people, everyone on this phone, we've got to come together and we've got to say enough is enough. And it's not just one or two people here and there. It's a few thousand people saying we want to change this. And Bob, I think what you're talking about is fundamental change. And that's what I think we need right now to, to fix that front door. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And yeah, I talk to my in-laws and, and, and they ask me that all the time. Yeah, I, I would just, I agree with with 95% of what was, what was just said. Um, but I also do want to remind us that many of these challenges exist in all of the urban cores around America, right? And there is something different about the city center and the urban core um, that does make it more challenging. I and mean, part, of, part of what makes it an, a great opportunity is also what creates the, the great challenge for us. And I think that, um, that we, that's also part of like rolling up our sleeves and, and, and the continued evolution of downtown. We've come a long way in the last 10 years, um, the property owners downtown, you know, voted to tax themselves additional funds for the, for the groundworks folks out on the streets that are, that are, that are pan and brooming and removing graffiti tags and are working with um, secondary uh, off-duty police officers. And, you know, 10 years ago, that was a huge, huge fight to be able to get off-duty police officers in the downtown core walking, walking around. And we fought that fight and, and, you know, we've come to where we are today. The, the work doesn't finish, right? And, and we need to, to keep going. But I would also just kind of like to acknowledge, as you all have, there's been a lot of work that's done that has brought us to this point today where people are bullish on downtown. And so while we're thinking about all the, the additional things that we need to work on and all the, the changes that we need to make, I think that in some ways we are our um, hardest critics. And we also need to, um, while we're striving to be better, we also need to give ourselves um, a, a little bit of credit for how, how far we have come. Yeah, Blog, I, I think what you're saying is right, but I, I, I still, I, I push back on that a little bit. I just, you know, truly, I, I've given so many tours of downtown, and it's just that I have not seen, from a safety perspective, the city getting better in the last two or three years. I just haven't. I, I wish. Yeah, I it's, it's tough, right? and, and this, the city has, there's, there's a, a lot of history around that. And I'm not yeah. disagreeing with you, Gary. I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm, I'm, I'm just, um, I am in your same, I agree with you about we need more resources and we want to advocate for more resources and we want to move forward. And the thing I would add is I think that, you know, because I think a lot of people kind of have a certain perspective of, of downtown and um, they, they keep on saying, why doesn't downtown turn a corner? Uh, so there, 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 there's some, you know, kind of history that needs to be unpacked and needs Absolutely. to be addressed, which Denver probably didn't have it, you know, or Nashville didn't have to the degree that we have it. So we've got to be better than those cities. And that's why, again, it comes down to leadership. And, you know, and I, I've heard some good things about the police chief and that he has, you know, he wants to move in the right direction. But, you know, I haven't seen it on the ground. And uh, so that's why I'm hoping that, that the city has an opportunity to bring a new police chief in. And hopefully we get someone who cares about community policing that wants to engage in the community, that's not gonna accept some of these things that we're dealing with. And listen, I know there's homelessness, there's a bunch of mental health issues that have to be you know, worked on as well, but uh, we, we gotta start to get the, these things resolved. Because... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I guess I, I just wanna make the point that every city, including Denver and Austin and other cities, every city, urban core has those challenges, right? And, and some of them handle them better than others, some of them have have more resources than, than others. And that's where we, I think, have an opportunity to come together in a different way and figure out how we get additional resources and, and maximize the resources that we have. And we haven't necessarily done you know, uh, um, the best job at that. So I, I agree with you on that point. I'd love to kind of jump to some of the questions and comments from the, from the chat. Um, comment I've seen a couple times here is love to get your, your thoughts on closing San Pedro Street permanently. Um, I remember the Super Bowl was in the area and just having that area activated. Um, part of why we expanded St. James the way we did the two ways was to absorb more traffic to take the pressure off of St. John. Um, just love to get your thoughts on, you know, innovative ideas like maybe closing San Pedro Street. 
Yeah, I, we are, uh, uh, we've done a number of pilots. Uh, like yeah. you said, the Super Bowl was a pilot. Um, uh, Council Member Corvallis had an initiative uh, last summer where he closed down San Pedro. And, and you can see um, that especially when the weather is good, it is hopping out there, which is, which is fantastic, right? It's, a, it's great public life. So um, we are uh, open to, to listening to what the businesses want. There, the devil is always in the details. There, there is, there's a willingness there to figure out how this might work uh, for, for the businesses, for the residents, um, for the, the garage that serves our major, um, our major uh, facility in the SAP center. So um, I don't think there's, there, you would find few people that would argue that it's not a good idea and that they're not open to it. It's really just a matter of figuring out how we execute it. And I would say that, that the most important people that we need to hear from are the folks that are the business and property owners that line the street, right? Because it's really them that make it happen. It's them that make the atmosphere by bringing out their tables and chairs and, and, um, and creating the vibe that is, that is so wonderful to be part of. Uh, Gary, what are your thoughts? since it's on the placemaking part of it. Um, you know, listen to me, you know, pla placemaking is fundamental to, to what, what, what we're all talking about. And uh, like, it's funny, like a bunch of the, um, it's funny, I've, I've just been, sorry, I've been looking at some of these emails that, they, you know, our architects are located in, in Tokyo and Denmark for some of these projects. And I'm just getting some updates on some of our projects. And as exciting as some of these buildings are, um, that doesn't make a place. Yeah, it creates a venue, but it doesn't create a great place. And uh, you know, that's why I said earlier, it's all about the people. And um, that, that's what we have to do. We have to think about art. We have to think about cultural aspects of the city. We have to think about um, the baristas and the chefs and, and where are they are gonna live? And, and I think one of the, my, my concerns and kind of realization I'm having is that, you know, I want the police officers who work downtown to care more, but you know, they don't live here. So, um, it, it's hard to care about a place that you don't live in. And they, uh, so I think we have to do a better job of finding, you know, housing solutions, whether it's for our essential workforce. Um, and I think if that started to become true that, you know, if a police officer now is protecting the place that he works and uh, the same thing for firefighters. I've talked to a bunch of firefighters say, listen, in the day, we used to live in, a, you know, outside the downtown and we'd have a whole community and it was something that we could, you know, we were part of the, this community. And, and now these guys are more transactional because they, they can't afford housing here. So, you know, to create a great place, I think housing is gonna be a big component of it. And this is one of those things we talk far too much about and we do so little. And there's so many excuses of why we don't do this. And I'm just not buying it. And uh, again, that, that's why you know, we're gonna come up with a plan in about six weeks that, that, that we think shows how we can build five to 7,000 units without government assistance. But a, uh, if we could bring together a broader coalition of people, because this to us is not about making money. This is not about a spreadsheet. This is about creating community and a place. Um, but man, there's, you know, there's so many people get stuck in these same loops of you know, conversations and you know, why these things can't be done and regulations and fees. And if we could just get out of our own way, I think we can make these things happen. Um, you know, Bob, Sometimes I think there is a silver lining to things, right? In this pandemic, you got to look for some silver linings. And closing down San Pedro Street, I think, is one of those. Really seeing the activation of that, you know, retail area, how it helps those businesses. Uh, Post Street is another example. I'd like to see more of that throughout downtown. But Gary's absolutely right when we talk about this placemaking and the difference between placemaking and creating a venue. You can create a venue, but nobody's going to go to it unless there are people here to go to it. Creating that uh enough people coming to downtown to want to be here to create these places that's the that's the key uh gary and i are working together doing the doing a lot of work next to fountain alley and as blogge said on the corner of first and santa clara you know that whole area is changing and it's changing in a positive way that it should be a destination that people want to go to even more than they do now i know that uh prior to the pandemic first street had a pretty active nightlight with restaurants and and people going there. And it's just going to add to that. Gary's project in the Fountain Alley parking lot is amazing. I love you know, what he's doing at the Bank of Italy and we have our Fountain Alley building right there. Um, 
also similar, our camera 12 cinema site over on the Paseo de San Antonio. I mean, with Jay Paul redeveloping City View Plaza, I mean, we've recently seen Scott Seafood and Morton Steakhouse move on to the Paseo de San Antonio. And it already had the grill on the alley. We want to put in a couple of, uh, you know, full service bars and restaurants and really create a, a restaurant row. But without the people feeling safe and wanting to come downtown, uh, the ability to create new housing so that we can house the people that, that live here now and want to live here in the future. And that is the, the, the secret ingredient that we need here downtown. Definitely agreed. And, and I think, you know, one of the placemaking things that I love for downtown was seeing the sonic runways at City Hall. You know, I mean, I was able to take my nephews to go see it and show them, you know, the building I used to work in. And, but just, you know, they had never seen their city hall before, right? They live in Willow Glen. And just being able to take them to a really cool, you know, public art facility. And oh, by the way, this is where decisions get made for the 10th largest city in America. And it's those kind of thoughts about, you know, activating dead spots of downtown. So I think we're all in agreement on that. Um, so let's look, you know, 10 years out. So you know, we get past COVID and we get some of these projects out of ground. Um, so where do you see downtown San Jose in 10 years? Anyone? Blog A, this is your, this is your wheelhouse. Come on. Oh, I see it. Um, I see it invigorated. I see it. I see it um, a place where we have, we have done all the things that we have talked about. Um, maybe not all of them because the, the, the evolution of a city is, is ongoing and, and perpetual, right? And so we're, we're never gonna be finished. My, my favorite t-shirt that we have is the one that says never finished um, because we're, we're constantly striving to do better. But I mean, I think that we, you know, with, with the private investment that we have, with the plans um, that, that we have on the books and, and the ones that are, that are coming up fast and furiously that we've talked about today, I mean, if you take a look at Park Avenue alone with the J. Paul investment at City View Plaza and 200 Park Avenue, and then Gary and West Bank um, at Park Habitat, you know, we're, we're looking at almost 5 million square feet of office there when it's finished. Right now, we have about eight and a half million in the whole downtown, right? And that, that's not even talking about the, the other projects that West Bank has. So with all that, we will, there will be people and we'll have more people and, and that sense of place. Um, we'll also have gone through a, a lot of heartache um, through a construction period that I'm sure will be difficult because construction is always difficult, whether that's gonna be for BART or that's gonna be these larger projects. Um, we'll, we'll have some casualties because I don't think it's realistic to think that we're, we're going to come through it 100% unscathed, whether there are some businesses that we lose or whether there are some people that move out of downtown um, uh, just because it's, it's too much. But, but ultimately, kind of keeping the focus and keeping that vision for 10 years from now, when we have you know, more residential housing, when we have more commercial office, when we have an even more vibrant um, a series of public spaces that, that are thread through our downtown. Um, when we have the, the transit infrastructure that we've been waiting for for, for decades um, and, and we have the expansion uh, that's currently planned on the books. Um, as, as long as we can kind of keep, keep that in mind, um, we are gonna be in, in, a good, in a good place. So it's it's really exciting, you know. I it's it's hard for me to believe I've been downtown now about 20, 22 years, <laughs> which is crazy. Thought I was going to be here for like six months, um, but you know, for for twenty two years now. And and the other day I was like, wow, I guess you have to be someplace for like for twenty five years to kind of see the the cycle. Um, we've we've come a long way, and we have a lot of really exciting things in the hopper. Um, and I know that that together with the people that care about this community, because there are so many people that care about this community um, and so many different aspects of it, it it's, it's gonna be a fantastic, um, a fantastic ride and, and a great destination. So I'm really looking forward to it. Bob, I love this question. Um, 
I've been asked before. I've heard Gary answer before, so that's why again I'm going to answer first before <laughs> Gary goes. Uh, <laughs> Make me go first. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, Ten years from now, BART's going to be done. Uh, Deerdon Station is going to be renovated. High-speed rail is going to connect to Deerdon Station. Caltrans is going to be electrified. People are actually going to take the VTA light rail system and all the buses in downtown. I would like, you know, sometimes I want to say I want to see this utopian version. I want to see 50 high-rise residential towers in downtown. I want to see us build enough housing to meet supply and demand. And I want to see a fair amount of below market rate housing so we can really help solve that issue. And that's also going to help solve that homelessness issue that I've seen throughout the comments over and over. Uh, I want to see this as an innovation center for the world. I want to see tech companies not just say, yeah, yeah, we're expanding to San Jose because there's nowhere else to grow in Palo Alto and Cupertino and Mountain View. I want them to say, we're going to San Jose because that's where the best people in the world create the greatest ideas that mankind has ever seen. Uh, I want ground floor retail to be activated. I want coffee shops and breweries and flower shops everywhere throughout downtown so that you really feel that sense of place when you come to downtown. Of course, solving our issues with crime and litter and graffiti, of course, that's all going to be solved, right? We're going to figure out a way in the next 10 years to really take those urban issues and learn from what other cities have done and create solutions that are meaningful and long lasting. And then really, I just, I can't wait to be a part of it. I can't wait to build buildings, be a part of this community, solve this, pro solve the problems that are associated with downtown, you know, for the rest of my career. Uh, I have nothing to say. <laughs> That's um, not true. That's not true. We know that. <laughs> You're our closer. You're yeah. our closer. Um, well, listen, I, I first want to start with a plug. Um, you know, a number of the questions, and I think the dialogue uh, for the uh, discussion today has been around things that we can do. And, uh, you know, we're creating something called the Urban Vibrancy Institute, which is supposed to help complement what Blog is doing, what the Downtown Association is doing, uh, and to really kind of focus on, you know, problems that we can slowly start to address. Uh, the walking patrol in, in downtown San Jose is the first thing that we want to reinstate. So we'd love to get people just to sign a petition uh, to, to get involved with that. So if, if anybody wants to uh, yeah, help us with that, uh, you know, please let Bob know. And we'd love to get your emails and then reach back out to you. But I think it's kind of a first step in trying to figure out, again, safety, cleanliness, and vibrancy. You know, how do we come together as a, as a team to do that? You know, again, I, I think what, what blogging Eric said is exactly the kind of the, the city that I want to see. The city I don't want to see is something that's incrementally better than what we have today. And I just worry sometimes that, especially with the budget cuts and where the city's at and the COVID issues, people might you know, be willing to compromise and say, you know what, that, that's okay. We, we should just, that's a, that's a pretty good solution for right now, as opposed to having extraordinarily high expectations for the development community for our transportation systems, for our energy systems, for the integration of San Jose State. Let's not compromise. This is the time that San Jose has an opportunity to say, we want to become world-class. We want to be an innovator. We want to set a tone for um, you know, what other cities around this world can become because we're working from a, 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 you know, a clean canvas. So um, I hope we don't end up there um, because I, I think we've all missed an opportunity. Well, I couldn't agree more in Balage. I started redevelopment in September of 98, right before the end of the Frank Taylor era. And yeah. so I right there with you on that. So um, well, that wraps up our discussion today. Thank you all for tuning in. A uh, video recording of today's Q&A will be available on the San Jose Spotlight website next week. To follow our coverage and learn how to support our efforts, please visit our website, sanjosespotlight.com. And thank you again to our sponsors, the Shane Hour Company and All Good Work Foundation, and hope to see you at our next forum. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank see you, ya. Bob. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Gary. See you.